Today I'm excited to continue our series on David, uh, looking at things we can learn from the shepherd who became king. And we started this a couple of months ago, and, and really looking at the fact, as you see with so many characters referenced in the Bible, there are men and women just like you and me. They're fallible, they make mistakes, but they keep pursuing God. And that's the thing about God, is he gives us grace. Somebody say grace. To live for him. And, and I love the stories in the Bible because they show us, and certainly it's true with David, that David had some big problems. He sinned big. But even though he sinned big, in particular with his sin with Bathsheba, another man's wife, uh, he still repented. Heartfelt repentance changed. And God said, yep, you're a man after my own heart. And so many of us, even to this day, know him as that man after God's own heart. So even though David was a big sinner, he took responsibility. We found out that David was a worshiper. Last week, we found out finally that David was a warrior and a winner, and he had a revolutionary way of thinking that started to spread all through Israel. In fact, David, you may know the story, David and Goliath, he slew that one giant, as I best know. It doesn't record in the Bible of him slaying any other giants. But David's mighty men slew many more giants and killed many more of, the, of their enemies' armies. And so I'll tell you what, it was a way of thinking. And let me encourage you today that, you know, if you'll stand up and think different in the society that we live in, other people will follow you. They'll respond. We just need men and women of God to step up and take our place and declare the truth. And I'll talk more about that this morning. But, you know, you and I have got to stand up for what's right in the society that we live in. Finally, today I want to talk about this, that David understood God's authority and submission to those he delegates it to. And, you know, most of us probably take this for granted and say, yeah, I know that's true. But, you know, we are living in a society that increasingly really doesn't have any respect for leadership, doesn't have respect uh, for any, in any level of leadership whatsoever, governmental, uh, police enforcement, and we'll talk about some of those things in the, in the body of Christ and so on. Children don't respect their parents, and the Bible's very clear that when we don't honor God's authority, that's whoever he puts in place. In fact, you, you may think, well, you know, what about a wicked ruler? I understand that, but all through the Bible, and even in current times, even though bad things have happened, God has brought about good even through wicked rulers, and change things. And God will move. And we see that in the life of David. You may know uh, the king that was king before him, King Saul, was not a good king. Uh, he didn't humble himself before the Lord. He was not obedient. He didn't respect the position or authority. But David, and you may not be aware of this, but even though David was anointed king, and then he went and slew Goliath, it was 14 years before he walked in the fulfillment of that word that was spoken over him. 14 years. Maybe you're going through something difficult. Today, you're facing something. How many know everything you pray for doesn't happen right now? Does anybody ever find that out? Some things do. Some things happen quicker, and I believe that. And I still, when I need something, I pray, and I believe God for a breakthrough. Some things happen quicker than others. But the bottom line is, in that time of waiting, you and I need to respect and position ourselves and submit to God's authority wherever he places it, whether it's in church, uh, the job that you work, you know, I, I say that, people say, I hate my job. Well, listen, you got a hold of them and filled out the application. They didn't see you out at Meyer and say, hey, I want you to work for me. I mean, that could happen sometimes, but that's usually not the case. It is a partnership that you enter into. And I believe God will move us on if you're working for a place that's not the best situation. You pray, but while you're praying and waiting, what do you do? You adjust your attitude and respect the authority that God has put in place. And when we live that way, because many times people will pretend... You pretend you like the place you work, but then you go home and all you do is gripe about it all night long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, when we do that, you know, God hear, God's got bigger ears than I do. Come on. I think my ears are bigger than they used to be. They say when you get older, Michael, they say your ears get bigger. Well, your ears and your nose. It's like you become all ear and nose. You lose all your other features. You'd be like Mr. Potato Head by the time I'm 100 years old. <laughs> Sometimes we just, we're sitting down on the outside, we're standing up on the inside. 
God's got big ears. He hears that. Going home, griping about the place you now praying and saying, you know, I, I really need to pray and praying with a friend or your spouse and saying, you know, well, I'm gonna pray for a breakthrough. This place is it's not really the kind of place I think God wants me to stay for years. So I'm gonna pray and see God do something. But you know, when you're honoring the authority and the the boss that God put over you, God will answer your prayers. And I'll show you that that works. I'll show you through scripture that you can't, you can't complain about the situation you're in in respect to authority and then cry and pray and expect your prayers answered. It does not work. All right, so let's start our story with David. Saul, I said he's a bad king. He's been king only a couple of years and he blows it big time. God to tells him to go and to kill the Amalekites. Let's read this together, 1 Samuel 15. He says, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. But kill both man and woman Infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and doggy. People read things like this in the Bible. Say, well, God, why did God tell him to kill him? And I've said this before, and, it may, and you may not agree with this, but I believe it to be true, that everything that's happened in the Old Testament, when God did things like this, it was to preserve the seed so that Jesus could be born at the fullness of time. That's what I really believe. That God was trying to make sure the seed would come from the woman. And you look through the lineages, and God had to wipe some people out. And we may not like to hear that, but God is God. And you, I tell you what, when you get to heaven, you ask him. And if you don't get to heaven, it'll be too late. You won't be able to ask him. So how do you get to heaven? You receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You submit to him because God knows better than we do. But he says, I want you to destroy him. Later in the same chapter, the prophet Samuel comes, and he says, but you didn't do what God told you to do. And, and, and Saul says, well, yeah, but I just kept, I just kept some of it. See, he said here to slaughter everything. So even though he went in, defeated them, he took the best of the riches, the best of the spoils, their oxen, their sheep. And then he says, well, I only took it so I could bring an offering to the Lord. I mean, how religious can you be? He keeps it for himself, first of all. God not only has big ears, he's got big eyes. He sees everything. And Saul said, I was just going to offer it to the Lord. Well, God knew better. Let's read on. Has the Lord have such a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Say obey. obey. And, to heed the, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion, it's the opposite of submission. It's witchcraft. When you live a rebellious life, the Lord says you're involved in witchcraft. Say, well, I'm making no portion, potions. I ain't getting no, no eye of newt and tail of frog. Well, yeah, but the Bible says right here that it's witchcraft, and I say the Bible's right. Witchcraft. He says, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness. You know why stubbornness is idolatry? Because you worship a false god. You know who that false god is? You. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with witchcraft. Witchcraft simply is me figuring out a way to get the things I want when I want them. Manipulation. Whatever. And God says rebellion is witchcraft. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Listen, it's better to fear God and not people. Can I get an amen in this place today? Amen. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you've rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you, speaking of David, and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Fourteen years pass. David has been anointed king. Saul is jealous of David. 
He persecutes him, even to the point of wanting to kill him. David is living like a criminal, hiding in caves, out in the wilderness. He's anointed king, but for those 14 years, Saul is pursuing him, trying to kill him. And you know, David never rebelled against Saul's authority. He respected him, honored him as king. On a couple of occasions, David got close enough, he could have easily killed Saul, and he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He said, I will not touch the anointed of the Lord. I will not touch the anointed of the Lord. It's a powerful concept. It's a powerful truth. Matter of fact, you think about not only David, but what about Jesus? And we'll, you know, look, we'll look at Jesus' life here in a moment. I want to give you some scriptures. But Jesus was the ultimate of submitting himself to the authority that God placed in the earth. A wicked government, the Roman government, overtook Israel, taxed them heavily. They were cruel. Not to mention the religious people of Jesus' day. And even though he rebuked the money changers and threw their tables over, Jesus still respected their authority, even to the point he said, well, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, listen, Jesus submitted to Pontius Pilate. Jesus submitted to the religious rulers. In fact, he's standing before Pontius Pilate, and he says to Pontius Pilate, you'd have no authority if it wasn't given to you by my father or from above. But he submitted to it. You say, how can you say that? In the garden, he said that he could call out legions of angels. He didn't do it. And I believe it's a time to fight for things, but you got to understand something, that God can move, and God did his greatest work in the life of Jesus by Jesus submitting not only to Father God, but the authority that was in the earth that was wicked and cruel. And so what we do is we look at wicked rulers and say, well, it doesn't apply. Well, Saul was wicked. David submitted to him, and I just gave you the example of Jesus. During the times that David ran around, he learned an important lesson of greatness. I believe that every person who decides to submit to God's authority, his direct authority, and delegated human authority on earth will be exalted. And the Bible teaches us that. Speaking of Jesus, some more as a 12-year-old boy, he's entering manhood. Jesus is ordered by his mother to leave the temple where he wanted to stay, but Jesus submitted to his parents. So this is a message for all the kids. They're back in children's church now. But You know, how about, it, how about if we make our kids obey? Somebody say, well, pastor, should I make my kids come to church? Absolutely. Well, they don't want to go. So what? Get their butt up and drag them to church. Well, I, they don't want to come, so I'll just stay home. I'll stay home and watch online. Now, that's okay once in a while, but get them up. Bring them to church. Say, well, they don't want to worship. Well, you, you can't make them do anything. And they, and they might be standing up on the outside, but sitting down on the inside. But that's their choice. But you say, you know, next time you come, I appreciate it if you engaged a little. I appreciate it if you, you didn't sit there and hide behind your hat when the pastor's preaching. Say, so, well, Pastor, how can you say that? We raised three kids, and we've got a grandson. As a matter of fact, our daughter and grandson are right here, and our, one of our sons is back there in the booth today. Our oldest son is taking some time off. Tony, people say, well, where's Tony been? I, I told him to take a month off. He's our worship leader. Uh, he's been doing this since he's 25, 10 years. He's been working. He's got a full-time job, part-time here at church. I said, you take the month of May off, and I'm going to pay you. And so he did. So he's down visiting another church today, so he's not here. But he'll be back next Sunday. And you say, Pastor, will you get a break? No, I'm playing drums almost every... I'd get a little time next month in June. Anyway, so we did that with our kids. Tony's 35. Our youngest, Aaron, is 30. 30. You just turned 30. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we told them they were going to church. I remember Selena won't mind. I, she had a little bit of a rebellious streak in her teen years. and We had some fun with that. <laughs> Pastor Bob, you remember, you remember some of that. Pastor Bob was my associate pastor for years, and he's retired but still plugged in and helping the church. He's, he's such a blessing, so he helps when he's not riding that big fat hog, you know. But, um, but she, you know, we made her come to church, and she'd say things to people. I'm like, I can't, John, look at you shaking your head. She would say things. I'm like, my daughter said that in front of the church. So why didn't you just let her stay home? Because she wanted to stay home, we wouldn't let her. 
We, and you know what? She's in church today, and her son's with her. So you can't make your kids, well, you can't make them, but you can sure tell them that they need to. And the Bible says to train up your children in the Lord so when they're old, they won't depart from the ways of God. Well, they may go through some rebellion. Most kids will. Some of you are still living like kids, rebelling against the authority God put in your life. What do, do you think your life's so hard? So I'll see so-and-so, they're getting blessed and this and that and the other thing. Well, maybe they're applying what I'm talking about, but you're not. Mm -hmm. Parents need to tell their kids they need to worship. Well, I'm going to stay home today. I don't feel like it. Yeah, stay home and play on your phone all morning while mom's at church. Right. Raise up your kids in the Lord. When they're old, they will not depart from it. But we got to get back to the Bible, people. We got to stop letting society dictate to the church how to raise our kids. And that's all part of this problem I'm talking about right here. So Jesus, he wants to stay in the temple. He wants to preach. Let's read this. So when they saw him, they were amazed. His mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us. Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Do you see that he was subject to his parents? That's where it starts. But his mother kept all these things in her heart and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor. When you submit to God's given authority, starting with parents and then everything else otherwise, you increase in wisdom, you increase in stature, and you increase in favor with God and men. If it was true for Jesus, it's true for you and I. So submission is such a spiritual truth. It's so key, and our society has forgotten what submission is. In fact, Jesus' entire ministry was based on principles of submission. John 12, look at this. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but my Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say, or what I should say and what I should speak. John 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Jesus saying, look, I do this by the authority that's been given to me, and you can search the word of God from back to front and front to back, and you will not find an exception to the truth that I'm talking about today. It's all through the word of God. And look at this finally about Jesus, Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, humbled himself, he humbled himself, and became therefore, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's true for David, it's true for all of us, it's true for Jesus. And I want to tell you something this morning, the kingdom of God is full of order and authority. It's the kingdom of darkness is full of chaos. And without authority, there is chaos. There has to be authority in place. If there's not authority, we all end up just doing what we want to do. Again, remember, we fall into idolatry and we make ourselves a God. Look what it says in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. See, when we're left to ourselves, our own way, we just go our own way. People say, well, you know, our kids, they'll figure it out. No, they won't figure it out. They won't figure it out. And because of the attitude we have, secular humanism has really become the unofficial religion of the United States and the Western world for the last 30, 40 years. And, and it's just, so now we're confused. Teachers can't even teach in school. Now, I'm 65. Maybe I already said that. 65 years old. 
And when I, when I went to school, I was a numbskull, and I, there's times I didn't behave. But I want to tell you, in general, there was a, there was a submission to the principal. You, when you go to the principal's office, you went to the principal's office. I mean, you, if you didn't, well, you'd get suspended, and then you get kicked out. So if a teacher called my parents and said, Tony did this or that, my parents backed the teacher. Not me. Yeah. Now we're like, well, you can't talk to my Timmy like that. What do you mean? <laughs> well, you know, Susie, she identifies as a cat. So she can bring her little bed to class and sleep over there. Your children cannot choose their gender or their race. Amen. Or... <clears throat> whatever animal they want to be. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. This stuff's happening. Teachers can't teach. Our, son's, our grandson Xander, he's sitting here. Hi, Xander. Hello, Xander. He likes to bark like a dog. Xander, do you like to bark like a dog? Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Come up here. Come here. Bark like a dog. See? He likes to bark like a dog, but Xander, Xander, come here. Come here. No, no, you got to come here, and then you got to sit back down. Come on, you got to sit down. He was diagnosed with autism. Didn't talk till he was five, and now he's seven, and now my daughter's going after him. See, I messed it up. He was sitting there behaving. And now I, I spurred on the rebellion in him, but here's the thing. You know, he, he, he goes around our yard, and... And he'll start barking like a dog. And I'll say, Xander, are you a dog or a boy? And he says, a boy. Amen. I said, are you a boy who likes to bark like a dog? He said, yes. But he knows he's a boy. Because we teach him that. Kids play and pretend to be other things. That doesn't mean they can identify as them. And, and this, this is what happened. In fact, they say even before, you know, I said I'm 65. But in the 40s and 50s, even the, some of the 60s, early 60s, you know, one of the worst things in school that teachers had to deal with was gum under the desk. Now we'll say, we got to ban guns. No, we need to get God back in school. And parents, we got to do our job. Church has got to do its job. But see, the church doesn't want to submit any more than the world does. Secular humanism, it's everywhere. Churches are buying into it. Some churches say, well, you don't even need a pastor or leaders. You know, just, let's just get together and God will raise up the leader every service. Are you kidding me? You talk about chaos. <laughs> Nothing would work like that. But some churches, that's what they think. There's such a growing respect for law enforcement. I, I got to tell you, you know, now there are times that officers act incorrectly. I'll say that. But with the way it is, where our laws are nowadays, pretty soon we're not going to have anybody that wants to be a police officer. I mean, my goodness, the criminal goes free and they persecute the officer if one little thing doesn't go right. Are you kidding me? See, and this is what's happening in our society. And it's because the church doesn't stand up. Some denominations... Church denominations devalue the word of God. It's no longer the authority of God. And so we come up with these doctrines and we embrace this humanism, this secular humanism in the church. We say, well, God just loves everybody. Yes, he does, but he loves us too much to leave us in our confused state. Yeah. And people don't want to hear that. I'll tell you why, because we don't want to be told what to do. Lack of respect and submission to authority is a huge problem in our society. Let every soul be subject, Romans 13, to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And here's the thing, you know, the president we have in the office, can I just say this? Resurrection Life Church does not support any candidate. Tony Pasquino does. Now I'm legally okay. So this is not the church. This is me. You vote for whoever you want to vote for, but your conscience between you and God. 
Whether you're here or in line, it's, it's up to you. But we need to vote the Bible in November. And we need to vote morals. Okay? Not the booming economy they keep telling us we have. Anyway, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. But I didn't vote for the president we have right now, but I respect him. You know, we got church organizations and people doing crusades. And listen, I think we should inform people about voting. I, I believe that. But some of these organizations, all they do is disrespect the candidate they don't like openly. That's wrong. It's wrong. Because, see, it's crept so much into the church. We want what we want when we want it. And I'm going to tell you something. No matter who gets elected in November and takes office in January, they will not fix our problem if the church doesn't stand up and start to fix it themselves. There is no government official that's going to fix it. And you know what? What if your candidate doesn't get elected? What if you vote for... <laughs> well, I got two choices. My goodness. I, and I... And God, and God uses it for good. I believe, no matter who's in office, I believe that. You may not believe that, but I know enough to submit to God. And I pray for our president, our vice president, as confused as they are. Well, I do. I, I'm just being honest. I'm not disrespecting them. They are confused. They think they're a president and a vice president. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> but, you know, and what we say is, well, they just fixed the vote. Okay. You think it's the first time they did that? What? Come on. Are you kidding me? Oh, it never happened before. Um, no, it happens probably every time. I'm not suggesting we don't vote. Don't misunderstand me. But if, here's what people do. They put more trust in their candidate than they do God. And they disrespect authority. And they'll disrespect the pastor who's talking like I'm talking. Because I'm not jumping on their train. Might vote for their candidate, but I ain't jumping on that train because my train is a lot better. <laughs> and the guy driving my train is God. Hmm. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, Romans 13, 2. And those who resist will bring judgment on us. You know, when you, when, we are living in a time where all of our The people that people look up to, role models, musicians, athletes, movie stars, we've all got this free spirit. You know, it's like trash authority. Do what you want. I mean, it's everywhere in the entertainment industry. And some of us, why do you let your children listen to the music they listen to? Well, it won't hurt them. Really. Really. Blatantly rebellious to all authority. It's everywhere. It's not, not every artist. Not every musician, not every athlete. I'm not saying that, but they're out there and people love it. They love it. What's the matter with us? It's idolatry, it's stubbornness, it's rebellion, it's witchcraft. Rebellion and stubbornness will cut off the blessing of God in your life. Listen carefully. Rebellion and stubbornness will cut off the blessing of God in your life. 1 Peter 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace. Somebody say grace. grace. To the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. God will exalt you in the proper time if you submit to him and his delegated authority in the earth. I believe that. But it says here that God resists the proud. Resist, that word means to set in battle formation. So when you don't respect authority, God is now your enemy. Why would you want God your enemy? You don't. But when we don't submit to authority in our attitudes, God is resisting us. You wonder why your prayers don't get answered. You got to wait sometimes, as I already said, anyway. Why do you want to make it worse? Rebellion leaves us without spiritual protection. It leaves you out of the protection umbrella that God provides. That's why submitting to a church is so important. Submitting to a church is so important. There's protection. No church is perfect, okay? Come on. Can we just say that? There's, there's no such thing. 
But when we submit to one another and submit to God's appointed leadership, pastors and elders and leaders, there's safety in that. When we stick to the Bible. Now, if we don't stick to the Bible, we're all in trouble. But we're going to stick to it. You got our word on that. James 4 says, but he gives more grace. Somebody say more grace. More grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Listen, you can't resist the devil if you don't first submit to God. You got to submit first. You can cry. You can shout at the devil at the, at, at the top of your lungs. But if you're not submitted to God and his delegated authority, that's, that is number one step in spiritual warfare. Submission. A submitted heart. God, I don't like the way things are, but I'm submitted. The place you have me working. You know, it's just really what we need to do. <laughs> in fact, salvation requires submission. Salvation requires submission, Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. you got to confess Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? You're no longer Lord of your life. That's salvation. That's how it starts. It's all about submission. And I believe we gain authority through submission. John 5, 19. And Jesus answered and he said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. See, God set the example that Jesus followed. You gain authority through submission. We already read in Philippians that Jesus gained authority through submission to God and the authority that God delegated in the earth. So you're not going to get promoted. No, no high-ranking officer is going to give the gun to somebody in the military who's not submitted to their senior officer. Are you kidding me? If we won't do that in the military, then why do we think the kingdom of God is any different? You don't give people authority that don't submit. Not only David, not only Jesus, but Joseph and Daniel. You look at their lives. Joseph was accused falsely, thrown in prison for something he never did. But he served while he was in the dungeon, and God promoted him. Daniel, you say, well, I thought Daniel prayed three times a day. Yes, he did. I'm not saying don't pray. When they tell you you can't worship God, that draws the line right there. But you know what? Daniel didn't rebel when they said, well, we're going to throw you in the, in the lion's den. He went. He went. Three Hebrew friends of his said, we're going to throw you in a furnace of fire. They said, well, if God delivers us, great. If not, we're not submitting to you, but we'll throw in. We'll let you throw us in prison. We're not going to rebel. We're not going to start a revolution. And God used it. They were in that furnace, and it says there's one other man in there, and he looks like the Son of God. Humble yourselves under the sight of the Lord, and he will exalt you. And submission accelerates us spiritually. Submission accelerates us spiritually. So what do you mean by that? When we submit to the way God says to live, we grow quicker spiritually. I'll just use myself as an example. And if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. I got saved 31 years old. I was all in living for the devil, and I got all in living for God. If the pastor said do it, I did it. Pastor said get involved in ministry, I got involved in ministry. Pastor said go to a small group, I got involved in a small group. Pastor said tithe, I tithed. That's part of the problem the church has got. We don't financially spend. And there's so many of you that are very, very, very generous. Let me just say that. But the, but the church as a whole, we're missing it there so much. There's so many things that the church cannot do because they don't have the money. People say, well, pastor, you just need to pray for it. Yeah, but the problem is you're resisting the word of the Lord, and I'm praying, and you're not giving. <laughs> That's true. Everybody has their part to play. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Submission will accelerate you spiritually. Matthew chapter 8, read this. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under the roof of my house, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, look at this, 
having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and I say to another, come, and he comes, and I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to those who followed, surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. A Roman soldier got Jesus' attention, and he marveled at his faith because he understood submission and authority. Tell you what, it's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God. It's how it works. And finally, I believe that submission brings supernatural favor. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. See, it starts at home. It starts with parents and children. And that's why the devil goes after the family. That's why it's all broken down. That's why parents don't parent. Because they got this stuff in their head. The devil's planted there that your kids can raise themselves. No, your kids need to be taught. Your kids need to be taught. It starts there, and then they honor authority from there forward. And you can't just shout commands at your kids and Expect them to listen. They need, you need to be relational. You need to be affectionate. I I'm not saying that. But children need to learn how to obey. And it starts at home. John 14, it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, but he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself. When we keep God's commands, when we live the way God says to live, Jesus manifests himself to us. Some people say, I just, I don't know, I don't ever hear God's voice. I, I don't even know. Well, are you submitted? Did you do the last thing God asked you to do? You submitted to your parents. You submitted to your husband or wife. Are you submitted to your boss? Are you submitted to the authority God puts in the earth, in your attitude? Don't have to agree with them. Don't even have to like them. But I mean submitted in, in your attitude. Rebellion is an attitude that when it's acted on, does things you don't want to do. But it starts with an attitude. Jesus said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He's keeping God's word. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, help us today. To realize how important it is to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Father, we pray for our nation's leaders. We pray for our, our law enforcement officers. We pray for our teachers and students. And we pray, Lord God, that we would start to teach our children at home how to honor the ch their parents. How to honor authority. How to respect you. That the church would rise up and take her place at the forefront of what's right. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.